Well, I'm joined now in the studio by the Labour MP, Chukra Muna. Thanks for being with us. Uh, Pleasure. Sunday Good to morning. be on your new show. Thanks. Um, well, we've been hearing there from voters in Cambridge. Yeah. Lots of them very worried about what happens with Brexit. In your own constituency, Lib Dem membership has doubled since the uh, referendum. Yes. Do you think that Labour are failing people who voted Remain in that vote? I, I wouldn't go that far. And the VT we just saw there, the video package, is interesting because it shows what we know about Remain voters, that they are split. Just over half of Remain voters are of the view that, look, the result is a result. Uh, it was fought under a set of rules we all agreed to, and now we make the best of a bad job. In secure the best deal for Britain. And just under half, uh, uh, as the lady round the table there was saying, in the, the kind of camp of second referendum, people were lied to, can't accept the result. Now, my, my own view is, as a Democrat, I accepted the rules under which that referendum was fought. In fact, I didn't receive any correspondence from constituents, and I have one of the highest Remain votes in uh, Lambeth, no correspondence from constituents saying that there shouldn't be a referendum and challenging the rules. So I think it's very hard to stand, uh, you know, in front of the will of the people as expressed in a national result from happening. But that said, I mean, I think when people look back at this in history, it's going to be more a question of what did you do on the referendum battlefield as opposed to, um, you know, exactly what you did in the aftermath. And the fact is, if you look during that referendum campaign last year, you know, the members of the Shadow Cabinet then, Tom Watson, our Deputy Leader, Angela Eagle, Heidi Alexander, others, fought a very strong campaign uh, during that referendum for us to stay in. And of course, Labour in for Britain, and Alan Johnson, myself, at, Vet at Cooper and others. We all, we all worked hard to get the best result. But unfortunately, we lost. And there would be no Article 50 if it weren't for the fact that we lost at that referendum. At the same time, if you're talking about what people did on the battlefield, yes. you voted in favour of Article 50 completely unamended. No Labour amendments got through. And I just want to drill down into yes. why you did that. I mean, you've previously said, for example, that leaving the single market is an act of self-harm that would tank the economy. That's right. But the problem... Why did you vote for an act of self-harm well, then? The, the, the problem... Well, I, I voted to implement a national poll and a democratic result in a referendum. But, of course, I mean, the idea that we were going to be able to stand in front of a government majority when we don't have a majority in the House of Commons, you know, to suggest that somehow we would easily be able to get amendments through would be completely disingenuous. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't have tabled amendments. I tabled one, for example, on the pledge made by many Conservatives um, to put £350 million extra per week into the NHS after we have voted to leave the European Union. Now, they, you know, in the end, went back on their word and voted against that amendment. I was a co-signatory to Harriet Harman's amendment to ensure that EU citizens have the right to stay here. Now, just because we were not going to be able to secure those amendments, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't have made the argument. And one of the interesting things, of course, in Cambridge, I mean, somebody was talking about we should have capitalised on these things. I mean, the interesting thing about the Liberal Democrats who, um, you know, see themselves as potentially a challenger in Cambridge is let's not forget the Liberal Democrat Parliamentary Party was just as split as the Labour Parliamentary Party through the passage of the Article 50 Bill in the House of Commons. And of course, the Liberal Democrats were attacking the Labour MP Daniel Zeitner in Cambridge for, for campaigning against having a referendum. They wanted this referendum in the first place. Let's, now, I think um, the, real, the real challenge, Sophie, I think for all of us as parties, is look, our country's clearly divided, but are we going to try and bring the country back together or are we going to do things that exacerbate divisions? And I think saying, look, we're going to ignore the result of this referendum. We're going to carry on as if all those who voted leave are somehow bigoted, racist people who believe their lies. I think that will divide our country. Now, they are no talking. more bigots we're and not, racists than, say, you know, the people who voted to remain. We're not talking about metropolitan ignoring elite liberals. the results of the referendum here. We're yes. talking about trying to shape the vision of Brexit. Yes. And it does feel to many Remain supporters that this week Labour handed the government a, black check, a blank cheque. Now, let's have a quick look here uh, at what you said last month. I'm not going to give Theresa May a blank cheque, but this week you voted through an unamended Article 50 bill, giving Theresa May a licence, therefore, to go forward with her version of Brexit. I mean, that sounds a lot like a blank cheque, doesn't it? Well, no, it's not. I mean, let's not forget, I put down an amendment on the NHS. I've, I, I was a co-signatory to an amendment to keep us in the civil market. I was a co-signatory to an amendment to ensure that EU citizens have the right to stay in the, um, in the UK after we leave the EU. But, of course, Article 50 in the referendum is one thing, but the deal is another. The negotiations haven't even started, and I think there are four 
key things that the Labour Party should be focusing on, performing our role as a strong opposition, holding the government to account, very much with the 2020 general election in mind. Because let's not forget what they promised, what the Conservative Party said in 2015. They said, if we hold this referendum and you vote to leave, it is not going to harm our economy. We need to hold them to account for that. They said, second, they are absolutely you know, focused on reducing immigration. That means that they need to make sure that the UK workforce has the skills and the wherewithal to do the jobs that businesses are feeling they need to hire people to do from outside the UK. We need to absolutely overhaul our skill system. Okay. They're nowhere near close to doing that. And then thirdly, they said, if we leave the European Union, after we hold this referendum, there will be more money for public services. So those okay. are three key things that the Labour Party must now hold those people, these Tories, to account for. And let's not forget, if, there, if all we have on the table is a bad deal, as Theresa May is kind of hinting at, could happen, that will be her responsibility. Because above all, they said, if we hold this referendum, which they did, with no plan for what would happen after we left the European Union, they said they will get a good deal. So if only a bad deal is on the table, that will be the responsibility of the Conservative government. And these are the issues, okay. I think, in, in the end, it will be competent management of this negotiation process, which will be core to the 2020 general election. Not whether you will remain or leave. In the end, did you competently manage this negotiation process? And we would have done it differently. And now, in so doing, competently manage the economy. I'm interested, Those will be um, the key issues, I think. I'm interested in getting your thoughts on another story that's been in the newspapers mm. today about Diane Abbott, uh, the Shadow Home Secretary, who, of course, voted for Article 50 this week it's reported that David Davis tried to give a hug afterwards, the Brexit secretary. Uh, and then he denied that, according to the Mail on Sunday, in a text to a colleague to say he wouldn't have done it because I'm not blind. Now, that sounds pretty sexist, does it? Particularly if it's directed to at the first black female MP, someone who's suffered from lots of abuse online. I think it's sexist. I think it's misogynistic. And he should apologise. It's appalling. Uh, Diane has also been subject to the most terrible racist abuse um, by a Conservative councillor who I understand is currently suspended. This type of behaviour has absolutely no place in the Conservative Party or British politics, full stop. And, uh, you know, David Davis, he is a member of the Cabinet. This is a member of the Cabinet. What does it say about that party to the country, to your viewers, if he's coming out with this kind of thing about a very respected, long-serving member of the House of Commons? Well, of course, the offer is there for David Davis if he does want to uh, come on the show and give his side uh, of what happened with uh, Diane Abbott. Now, let's talk polls because the polls are looking pretty disastrous for Labour at the moment. Mm. The Conservatives have led in the last 67 of those polls. Yeah. Um, and you have a leader who is disliked, more disliked than liked with every single voter group. I think we can just have a quick look at a poll from this uh, week, which showed what is Labour voters' opinion of Jeremy Corbyn, and more Labour voters had an unfavourable than a favourable opinion of their own leader. Is it time for him to go, particularly bearing in mind that there's polling going on by the Labour Party, we understand, of, of potential successors? Look, we've got two by-elections coming up in a few weeks. Well, I'm and quite interested got, to talk about the Jeremy Corbyn's I, I know you leadership. Are. I know you are, but I think talk of changing leader, leadership bids and what have you right now, when we've got these two by-elections in mind and also a swathe of local and regional elections in May, wouldn't be very helpful. Of course we've got to do better. But that isn't just about the leader. Uh, that is about the party and what we're saying to the people. And I so think if, part of the reason... if Labour does lose then in Copeland or Stoke, these two by-elections that you're talking about, yes. I mean, that would be the first time an opposition lost to a government in 35 years. If that happens, is that then time for Jeremy Corbyn to consider his position? Well, I don't accept the premise of the question because we've got two fantastic candidates in Copeland and Stoke-on-Trent. I was in Stoke-on-Trent um, last week and I'm confident that we will be able to get the results there. And then we have to march on to ensure that we get the results in May. But I think the fundamental... Um, way that the Labour Party will be able to recover its position. I'm not going to be disingenuous with you, Sophie. The polls have been terrible. And, you know, you need to be doing better than that for more former majority at the next general election. But I think the core for the Labour Party in terms of the way we build our support again is not a return to new Labour. That was appropriate for its time, but we're in a different era now. 
not to return to the Labour Party of the 70s and the 80s, old Labour. We need something that is appropriate for this time. And what we know is that our country has gone through a huge amount of change due to technology, due to the way global countries' economies are coming together. And this is causing a huge amount of insecurity. It's giving lots of opportunity to some, but it's exacerbating inequalities and reducing access to opportunities but, for others. Now, we have... Now, I don't, I don't disagree with, yeah. with your summary of the situation yes. there, but if you look at the polls, people don't feel that Jeremy Corbyn, it appears, even Labour voters, mm. is tackling those issues. I mean, do you think it's right, then, that some succession planning should be going on? No, because I think what we have to do is get back to the fundamentals. And the issue for the Labour Party is we have to reconnect to our core purpose, which is not only to help and protect those who cannot work and protect themselves, but to ensure that we speak for the mainstream, mainstream majority of working people in this country. We have to give people the confidence that we will do that. And also, they want to see in our party their values respected, their love of their family, the importance of their community, the love of their country. And that's why going down the kind of remain leave prism, going for the 48% or the 52% makes no sense, because in the end, it's those core values, which everybody holds dear, regardless of how you voted in last year's referendum. And it's those values which are things that we coalesce around. That's how we heal the division in our country. Now, if we can't um, heal the divisions in the historic voting coalition that makes a Labour government happen, people in Streatham and people in Cambridge, people in Hull, people in Hampstead, then we won't be able to get back into office. But my gosh, if we are able to do that within the Labour Party, then we will show that we're fit for government. And do you know what? I have no doubt that we can do that at the next general election. I believe inherently, because I know our values are the best values, <laughs> and they deliver for working Quite. people, and they, in the end, regardless of your creed, colour, race or background, will ensure that you can access the opportunities that this new world is bringing. That's why I'm confident and optimistic about the <laughs> Labour's future. You, you've made quite a speech there. Sounds a bit like a, <laughs> sounds a, bit like a leadership manifesto. No, I just believe in my party. I'm a Labour person. And in the end, I'm, I'm, one of the things I've hated about past Labour leadership contests that we've had is this idea that somehow you either choose your values and what you believe in or you choose power and office. And I've always believed, ultimately, that we can only make our values real as a Labour party if we get into government. But like I said, the value of work, the value of people's community, their love for their family, their love for the country, you, they see that in the Labour party, they will vote for us. You obviously uh, ran in 2015, pulled out three days later. Yes. You then didn't step forward when Owen Smith and Angela Regal tried to dislodge Jeremy Corbyn. I'm afraid I, I was did, on my honeymoon did you, <laughs> for part of that. Do you, do you think you're getting a reputation of chickening out? I don't think so. Uh, look, uh, I don't think you go into politics to be part of some soap opera. In the end, you go into politics to change things. And, you know, I want to play a big role in a future Labour government. But, you know, how that turns out in the future is anyone's guess. But right now, as I said, the Labour Party shouldn't be focusing on leadership bids and future leaders. It should be focusing on winning these two by-elections that we've got coming up. Winning, winning the county council elections and also the mayoral elections coming up in May and then using that as a springboard to get back into office. But as I said, in the end, people will judge us not just by the alternative we're offering, but how this government does. And it won't be whether you will remain, remain or leave, it's how they competently manage the process of our withdrawal from the European Union. Okay. And all the signs are at the moment that they want to turn us into the sweatshop of Europe, they want to turn us into a grand tax haven for rich multinationals well, we and won't, people, um, and that, that's not going to provide the answers, and we have to make sure people know that. Well, we won't have too long before we get voters' verdict in, Stateland, in Stoke and Copeland, so we'll have to see what happens there. Chukramuna, thanks very much. Thank you, Sophie.